Lord, I want to thank you so much for everything you do. I want to thank you so much for being so willing to to meet us in this place, even though, Lord, we are a broken people. Lord, I want to thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us even while, while, while we were still sinners. Lord, who loved us and created in us a heart to love you and to love other people. Lord, as we dive into this text of Scripture this morning, I want to ask you to just to speak to our hearts and, and our minds. Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us minds to understand. And, and Lord, give us hearts to better love you. Lord, Lord, change us this morning. Draw us closer to you this morning. Let this text of Scripture weigh on our hearts. Let it be an encouragement to us, Lord, and let it convict us wherever we need to be convicted. Lord, we love you so, so, so much, and thank you for everything. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, When I look at the world today, there is a tendency that that most people have, I, I think, and it is the the tendency uh, we have to sell ourselves short. Have we heard this phrase before, to sell ourselves uh, short? Uh, we live in a world uh, that raises us and assigns us worth based on our performance, right? And so if we uh, come uh, to some point in our lives where we are doing something and we don't think we are quite the performance Former that we need to be to do this, or we don't think we have enough skill, or we don't think we have enough talent to do this thing, we sell ourselves short. We are overly critical of ourselves, and as a result of growing up in this type of works-based world with this works-based system of, of performance, we are also overly critical of others. And I know that if you uh, are to observe the world uh, like I have, that you would find that the same thing is true. It's true in our schools, it's true in our workplaces, and it's probably true in many, many, many churches because culture and society is so performance-based we tend to be overly critical of ourselves and we tend to be overly critical of others. I remember uh, when I was um, singing with a band, I played uh, guitar as well, we were doing this show and there were a couple other guys there doing the show with us and they were going to perform uh, before us and I looked up to these guys musically. All right, uh, There was one guy, uh, his name is Chance, not Chance the Rapper, a different Chance, okay? Uh, His name was Chance, um, still is Chance as far as I know. He hasn't changed his name, but he was awesome at playing the guitar. It was so smooth. He, like, had this smooth blues style, and he would sing, and his voice would just make you melt. And no, I don't feel uncomfortable saying that about another man, okay? Uh, His voice would just make you melt, and we often would make fun of him because when he would play guitar, he would stand like a flamingo and stick his tongue out and stuff. Um, But he was so so good and as far as I was concerned he was way out of my league when it came to playing guitar when it came to singing the other group that we were with uh, that night had this lead guitarist that was amazing and they had more of an alternative rock kind of style and and he would just get up there and when he got to a guitar solo it was ridiculous Um, I felt insignificant standing next to those guys and they were before us playing the show and they would play And then I was left thinking, how in the world could I follow that? How in the world could I follow that? We are often overly critical of ourselves, and we buy into this performance-based system of assigning worth to ourselves and to others. And my, my question this morning is going to be this. How do we think God feels about this tendency that we have, this performance-based tendency that we have? How do we think God feels about that? How does God, or why does God choose the people that he chooses? Is he more concerned with our performance, or is he more concerned with our faithfulness? Why does God choose the people that he chooses? We are here, Judges chapter 4, the last part of Deborah's and Barak's and Jael's story in the text. Judges chapter 4, starting in verse 17, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. This is God's word. Meanwhile, Sisera, remember Sisera is the 
the Canaanite general warmonger guy who is oppressing Israel. All right. Meanwhile, Sisera had fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite, because there was peace between King Jabin of Hazor and the family of Heber, the Canaanite. Jael went out to greet Sisera and said to him, Come in, my lord. Come in with me. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened a container of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him again. Then he said to her, Stand at the entrance of the tent. If a man comes and asks you, Is there any man here? Say, No. Hide me from the people who are chasing me. That's what he's saying. While he was sleeping from exhaustion, Heber's wife, Jael, took a tent peg, grabbed a hammer, and went silently to Sisera. She hammered the peg into his temple and drove it into the ground, and, of course, he died. When Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to greet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her, and there was Sisera laying dead with a tent peg through his temple. That day, God, this is important, God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. The power of the Israelites continued to increase against Jabin of Canaan until they destroyed him. As we look to this passage of scripture, I want to observe it in in two parts this morning. Uh, First of all, I want to look at what it means to be chosen by God, to be blessed by God, why God chooses certain people to do his work and, and doesn't choose others. And then I just want to again abide in the glory of God. So we will look at being chosen and then we will, we will consider again God's glory. Uh, in this passage of scripture, there are, there are three like main characters who are good guys, right? There is Deborah, who served as a prophetess and a judge. We get that at the beginning of Judges chapter 4. There is Barak, who is the Israelite general. And there is Jael, who is this housewife who is not mentioned until the very end of the story, right? Uh, Not uh, worthy, really, of being considered by uh, the world's standards at this point in time, yet she becomes this main character in the story, and she is the one who essentially deals the final blow in the story to Israelites' enemies. God uses her uh, in this way. Uh, Here is what I, I realize when we think about the types of people that God chooses. As we read through Scripture, over and over again through the scriptures, we see God choosing people who are humble in spirit and people who are humble in their circumstance. Deborah was serving as a judge. Barak was the leader of Israel's army. If somebody is going to win the victory, it's going to be one of these two, right? You're going to guess beforehand that these guys are going to defeat Israel's enemy. And God, because God desires to receive all glory, right? That's what we've been talking about this whole series. This is what brokenness in the world is about. It's about taking us from trying to achieve our own glory and about pointing us toward God and, and pulling us in to abide in the glory of God. God is doing this thing in such a way where no one can say, Israel delivered Israel or Deborah delivered Israel or Barak delivered Israel. No, there's this housewife. And Sisera goes and hides in her tent and she takes the opportunity that God gives her. This isn't happening if it's not a work of God, right? God takes Jael, this woman, this housewife who is not a judge and and who is not a prophetess. Uh, Jael uh, isn't trying to do anything on a national level at all. She's not pursuing political office of any kind. She is a housewife, right? She's just tending to the duties of her household. Jael is not this this strong military presence. Jael doesn't have any any specific skills or talents that we know of. She doesn't even have any, any decent weapons in the house, right? She grabs a tent peg and he uses that to destroy the leader of the Canaanite army. God is doing things in such a in such a way. When we read the story in Scripture, the the only the only conclusion we can draw is God is doing this work. God is delivering his people Israel. God is freeing his people from the oppression, not just of their physical material enemies, but from the oppression of sin in their lives, which 
which we have talked about. God is doing this work. This isn't the only place in Scripture that we see this, right? We can observe, uh, absolutely observe um, redemptive history and see God doing this over and over again. Redemptive history is what we are experiencing now in this life before Christ judges the world and brings us into our eternal existence in His kingdom. We call it redemptive history. We can look through redemptive history as it is recording, and we can see God working like this with every generation Noah, Noah was a man who was essentially bullied by the entire world. Have we thought about that? Noah was a man who was essentially bullied by the entire world. Humble circumstance, humble in spirit. God chose Noah, used Noah. Abraham was a wanderer. He was a nomad. He hadn't built a nation yet. God chose this wanderer. Jacob was a a con artist, and he was a jealous man, and he was out to get his brother, right? Still his inheritance. And God didn't choose Esau, the older brother. He chose, chose Jacob. We see this through, through the scriptures. David was the youngest of his brothers. Samuel came before all of David's brothers, right? And with each one, with the oldest, Samuel was like, surely God, this is the one you have to be king of Israel. And God said, said no, not that one. And not any of the other brothers that are, that are here. The youngest one who's out tending the field, who the father didn't even think to bring before you. That's who I have to be, the, the king of Israel. This is the way that God does things. Takes people who are humble in spirit and humble in context and he raises them up, not for their own glory, but for the glory of God. We get to the New Testament. Think about Jesus, the Son of God incarnate. He wasn't born uh, in a, a, a castle or a, or a palace. He came as a servant. These are his own words. He came as a, a servant. He was, he was born in a tub that animals ate out of. Jesus, the king of the universe, before giving his life on a cross, before his earthly ministry, came as a servant, was born in a manger. Humble circumstance, humble in, in spirit. Paul, the apostle Paul, he lost, lost his status, right? He fell from his Jewish status, which was very prestigious. He fell from that, and God chose him and used him. God brought him to humility and then raised him up from that humility to be used for God's glory. All of the disciples, you don't see Jesus going uh, into the Jewish schools and picking out the best students or the best rabbis. No, he goes to fishermen, he goes to tax collectors, he goes to, to sinners, Right? God is always choosing people who are humble in their context and who are humble in spirit. And he is raising them up for his glory, for his glory. And Jesus, as Jesus walked and as Jesus taught, he didn't leave us to, to, to question this. He didn't leave us to wonder about what sort of person does God choose to do, to do his work. No, Jesus taught explicitly about this. We don't, we don't have to question this. We don't have to look to uh, an Old Testament story, even though we can, and just try and derive this information from an Old Testament story. No, Jesus taught it explicitly in, in a passage of Scripture that we call the, the Beatitudes. Does this sound familiar? Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. And brothers and sisters, let me just, let me just read this for you. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted humble circumstance humble in spirit blessed are the here it is humble for they will inherit the earth this is the work that god is doing Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, 
says Jesus, because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who came before you. God, the reason he does what he does or or the reason he chooses the people he chooses to do his work is not because they they have something to offer, because they're the most uh, talented musician or preacher, uh, because they uh, have this great skill set behind them. Uh, God doesn't choose people based on those things. We even, we even look at the nation of Israel. Why did God choose the nation of Israel? Do you guys know why God chose the nation of Israel? Why? What's going on in the mind of God? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. And feel free to write this down and read through this later. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. God gives us the answer in Israel's history. He says explicitly there, I did not choose you because you were more numerous than the other nations, because you were not more numerous than the other nations. He also says, I did not choose you and use you because you were righteous, because you are not a righteous people. In fact, we we read through Israel's history, right? Obviously, they are not a righteous people. No, God wasn't raising up a, a people to glorify that, that people. He wasn't raising up a people from their own strength. He was raising up a people so that in their weakness, his strength would be made evident. He wasn't raising up a, a people from their strength. He was raising up a people so that in their weakness, his strength would be made evident. God receives all glory. God is the only one to whom glory Belongs, And as we've been talking the, the last three weeks, right, that's the reason that we experience brokenness and, and hurt and, and suffering in this world. It's the reason we are overly critical of ourselves regarding our performance. And God looks at us and he says, look, child, I do not judge you based on your performance or your talent or your skill or your righteousness, or the size of your nation, or the size of your bank account. I do not judge you based on any of these things. I choose you so that my strength may be made known in your weakness, and so that I might receive glory through you. This is the reason that God does what he does. And so here in this place tonight, those listening on on Facebook Live or watching on Facebook Live, look, we often feel hurt, right? Like me playing in a band years ago, looking at at these other guys and, and thinking to myself, how can I follow that? We are overly critical of ourselves. We are overly critical of others. Uh, We feel the weight of this world as we are judged by our performance. We are stressed out because there's not enough time in the day to get everything done that we need to get done. We feel like we don't really know how to raise our children, right? We're just trying to figure things out as, as we go. And, and uh, we read book after book after book, and that doesn't seem to help, right? We feel the weight of insufficiency bearing down on us. We feel. We feel it in the depths of our bones, The world is broken, and we are broken under this weight, and God is working this out in our lives on purpose, because he wants us to know that we really are weak, and he wants us to abide in his glory and his strength, and when we abide in his glory and his strength, remember that always always works out for our good because that's what we were created to do. It is what we were created to do. For a pastor like myself or for a preacher or for anybody who, who teaches in, in any setting, right? 
This is important for us to know. It means that when we stand before someone in order to teach or in order to, to preach or in order to, to offer something that might be helpful and might be beneficial, we don't, we don't come from a place of strength. We can't come from a place of strength thinking that, thinking that we have something to offer people that they don't already have access to. No, we, we have to come in our, in our weakness come in our weakness so that in that weakness Christ's strength might be made evident and becomes really an act of service to our musicians, you know, our, our singers. Uh, when we stand before the congregation in order to serve by leading the music of the church. We don't come from our strength thinking that we have enough talent behind us or we have enough skill behind us or, or uh, we don't come before the congregation thinking about our technical prowess, right? We can't come from a position of strength because we have nothing to offer the God of the universe. We come from our weakness hoping that somehow through my efforts in, in leading music or in leading in any way, Someone, despite my insufficiencies or in my weakness, would see the strength of God behind me. And would then come to abide in the glory of God through something as simple as, as church music. The same applies to any position we might fill in the church, deacons and, and Sunday school teachers. The same applies to, to any position that we might fill outside of the church whether we're teaching in school or whether we're doing manual labor or, or whether we're working in some sort of government capacity. We don't, we don't come from our strength. We come from our weakness. We come from our weakness. And that's the way that it has to be if we ever hope to be chosen and used by the God of the universe. Here, Grace Baptist Church, we don't come before our God and we don't come before our community from from a place of, of strength. God doesn't choose churches based on their numbers, and the, the, this text applies specifically to us, right? God, God doesn't choose a church based on numbers. God doesn't choose a people based on numbers. God doesn't choose a people based on their righteousness. No, God chooses people out of their weakness. And I, I personally think this is a great comfort. I personally think this is a great comfort. And it's not like God, the God of the universe, isn't using everyone, right? Isn't using everyone in some way. God was using, using Pharaoh, like we learned about on Wednesday. God was the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart and Romans. And Paul says, does God not have the right to prepare vessels for wrath and vessels for glory, vessels for dishonor and vessels for honor? Does God not have the right to do that? No, he does. God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. But here's, here's what I learned. If I am coming from a place of humility, from a place of brokenness, from a place of weakness, God is choosing me to use in a positive manner for his kingdom, for his glory. But if I am prideful, God is working out my life, still achieving his own glory, by the way, but he may be using me in a negative manner. That's not blessing. That's the opposite of blessing. That's, that's called being cursed by the God of the universe. And those, those who are in their pride that God wishes to use in a positive way for His glory, always, just like the Apostle Paul, always he brings them to a place of humility like he did Paul, even blinding him on the road to Damascus, right? Always brings them to a place of humility, breaks them, and then raises them up for His glory. And then we get to abide in the glory of God, which is this amazing experience. And I can't even begin to describe it to you. But if you are here with me, then you, you know. If you are here with me, then you know. Here's the first thing that we learn in this passage of Scripture. God chooses those who are humble. And God uses those who are humble. Secondly, I just want to take a few moments and abide in the glory of God. Look here at the last verse in Judges chapter 4, the last couple of verses in, in Judges chapter 4, uh, verse 23. 
that day, God. That day, God. Not J.L., not Barak, not Deborah. That day, God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. God. This is a work that, that God is doing, and he is doing this for his glory and his glory alone, which he is working out for himself, yes, but also for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is working all of this out for his glory. The reason God chooses to use Jael and not Deborah and not Barak and not any other Israelite is because if he uses Jael, then he is drawing attention not to Jael, the housewife, but to himself as sovereign and to himself as God and to himself as the deliverer of Israel and the deliverer of his people and to himself as the one, the only one who can sustain his people and deliver his people from the oppression of sin, which all this represents. We've learned that over the past three weeks. God does this for his glory for his glory and my good and your good if you are in Christ. The work that God is doing is absolutely amazing, brothers and sisters. Now here in this text of Scripture, since, since God uh, uses a, a woman rather than a, than a man, uh, I feel that this is a good time to talk about the role of of women in the church. In fact, this text of scripture speaks a lot into the women's role in the church. Deborah, we see Deborah in this passage of scripture. Deborah is a prophetess. Does anyone know what a, a prophetess is or what a prophetess did? It's not just somebody who predicts the future, even though that was part of it in the Old Testament. A prophetess was someone who declared declared the word of God to the nation of Israel. And so God was using Deborah, a woman, in this way. But Deborah wasn't only a prophetess. She held a governmental position in Israel. She held the position of of judge. And the judge would judge Israel, judge between the disputes in in Israel, and would seek to vindicate Israel, um, liberate Israel from their enemies, judging the world outside of Israel. Deborah, a woman, was being used by God to do these two things. And when Deborah spoke to Barak, do you remember this part of the story? When Deborah spoke to Barak, she specifically said, God will sell the Canaanites into the hands of a woman so that you, Barak, a man, will not receive honor for what God is doing. And then Deborah, Deborah doesn't even get to deliver Israel, right? God doesn't even deliver the Canaanite army into Deborah's hand. He delivers the general into the the hand of a housewife who's not even prepared for battle. J.L. What does God's using and choosing J.L. to do this mighty work mean for women in the church today? First of all, it means means this. We, brothers and sisters, as the church, we like to we like to create these neat little categories. We like to define these neat little categories. And we like to, to put people within these, these neat little categories. And we like to uh, define these categories. And we like to take God and put God into this neat little category so that we could try and think about him, him better. Look, God doesn't fit into our, our human-made boxes. He doesn't. He doesn't at all fit into our human-made boxes. And so when things work out in the world, we read this story in, in the text of Scripture about God using women specifically so that men will not receive, receive honor. It bothers some of us today because God is, is, doing, is doing this in a way that we, we wouldn't necessarily expect Him to. And I might create the argument, maybe that's precisely the way God, uh, why God is doing things the way that He is doing. God doesn't fit into our human-made boxes. And when we see the way reality works out and the way God seems to be doing things, and it doesn't fit into our human-made boxes, and we can't define it according to the categories that we have created for ourselves, it gets a lot of people really frustrated. It makes many people frustrated, especially in today's context. 
But God, remember, is not doing this for the glory of people. God does the things that he does specifically so that he will receive glory. That is God's motivator. That is why God does what he does. He chooses people and uses people so that he will receive glory. There's a verse of scripture uh, that we have to to turn to and talk about in light of this passage in the Old Testament. Uh, God using women in such a powerful way. Uh, We then must turn to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and talk about Paul's instruction to the church regarding women. And I just want to read this for you. And don't, don't turn your ears off when I read this part of the story. We need to come to grips as a church family, as the people of God, with what this means for us as the local church in our day. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 8 through 15. Therefore, I, this is Paul writing, therefore I want the men in every place to pray lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, in decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess to worship God. A woman is to learn quietly with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. With good sense. So here uh, we almost see this like contradiction, this tension in the text of Scripture. In one text of Scripture, God is using women, uh, a woman as a prophetess, what would be uh, considered in our day to be a preacher or pastor even. Um, God is using a woman as a judge of Israel uh, nationally. God is delivering a general into the hands of Jael, using women specifically so that men will not receive honor. And then we see Paul saying something like, I do not permit women to teach or to have authority over a man at all. What in the world is going on in the text of Scripture? Has Paul, the Apostle Paul, has he contradicted the Old Testament in any way? I'm going to say no. No, he has not. There's this important thing called context in the text of Scripture. We have to understand what comes before before we understand the passage at hand. We have to understand one passage of Scripture in light of the the entire body. So the mistake we make when we read a passage like this passage in 1 Timothy is that we take it and we isolate it and we don't look at the surrounding text and then we form all of this doctrine around this one text of Scripture even though there is uh, another text of Scripture, in fact, uh, the letter, 1 Timothy, and then the Bible as a whole around it that we have to look at too in order to understand this. And again, we create our human-made categories and we expect everything that God does to fit into these categories, but God does not fit into our box. Can we look at the context together? Is that okay? Look at verse 9 here, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Also, or likewise, the women are to, and then he gives the command for women. Likewise what? Look at verse 8. I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. This uh, instruction that Paul has for women is like the instruction that he has for men. They are instructions of the same type. Look at verses 1 through 7 there in chapter 2. First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and for all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Get this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. 
Paul doesn't start by saying, women, you need to be submissive to the men in your church. No, he starts out by saying, Christ is preeminent. Christ is the one who delivers. Christ is the one who died for you. Christ is the one who stands in your stead. Christ is the head of the church. This is the point that Paul is making. And then after this, he says, actually in the midst of him saying this, he says, kings and rulers, be humble, gentle, quiet. Okay, kings and rulers. Men, humble yourselves, pray, pray, lifting up holy hands. And women, quietness, gentleness, modesty. Paul is not just saying, women, be humble, sit down. No, he's saying, all of you, because you are not in charge, are subject to the God of the universe. And so you, all of you, must be humble. And that's going to apply differently in, in, in different groups, to kings and then to men in the church at Ephesus and then to women in the church at Ephesus. But why in the world would Paul say something like, women, I do not permit you to to teach Ephesian women specifically, I do not permit you to, to, to teach or to have authority over a man. Well, can you guess how I'll answer this question? Context. Context, context, context. Look with me at chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, he's writing to Timothy. Remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine. So there's some false doctrine, some false teaching going on in the Ephesian church. Or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. So people are teaching myths. They are thinking them, themselves to be something because of the line of the descendants that they, they come from. Myths, endless genealogies. These promote empty speculation rather than God's plan which operates by by faith. Now the goal of our instruction is to is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some some have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless discussion. They want to be teachers of the law although they don't understand what they are saying or what they are insisting on context is important. And by now you see probably where I'm going with this. There was a lot of false teaching in Ephesus. People were overly concerned with myths or legend and and genealogies. Endless, endless genealogies. People wanted to be teachers of the law, but they did not understand the law. And I think there was probably a specific group of people in the Ephesian church that, that was doing this. There was fruitless discussion. Now tell me, what reason would Paul have for instructing a certain demographic of people not to teach or to hold a place of authority in the church? To protect the body at large from all of this that was going on. And history, the historical record of, of Rome, yeah, we can look at that too. It confirms the suspicion here. Artemis was the patron deity of of the city of Ephesus. Artemis, uh, supposedly the Greek goddess who um, promoted women above men so that women could, could, could essentially step on men, if I could use that terminology. There was a cult in Ephesus, a religious uh, cult um, that was anti-male. Everything was anti-male. Part of the, the legend, the myth of Ephesus founding, which I'm sure was part of this myth that was being taught in the church at Ephesus, was, was that the Amazons, does this, does this term sound familiar? The Amazons? Do you know who the Amazons are? Wonder Woman is an, was an Amazon, apparently, right? The Amazons, warrior women huntresses, founded the city of Ephesus. And that because of this, Ephesus was to be a city of of matriarchy to where men could not hold a a position of government at all. It didn't work out because Rome's in charge, right? But this is what people were pushing for. We see some similar movements in in our own day. But you begin to see the context, the people to whom Paul is is writing. The false teaching that would have have come into the church uh, would have been teaching specifically about the exaltation of, of, of people 
rather than the glory of God. It would have been about people trying to pursue glory for themselves rather than abide in the glory of God. All of the sudden, what we read in Judges and what we read in in 1 Timothy, it's the same, right? God is doing the things that he does to deter people from seeking their own glory and to bring them into his glory. This isn't about subjecting women to men. No, it's about being sure all people know that they are subject to the only true God of the universe. Artemis does not have a place here. This is why Paul is writing. That's why he gives the instruction that he does. Kings, rulers, be humble. And this is how you, in your context, be humble in this society. Men, practice humility. And this is how you practice humility in this context with everything going on. And women, practice humility. And this is how you can, in the city of Ephesus, practice humility with all of this junk going on that's going on in Ephesus. The, the message that we receive here in First Timothy is not that women are to be under the ruling, domineering authority of men. It's not it at all. It's that we are all subject to God. And in our context, we ought to strive to practice humility, not come from a place of strength. This is what we're learning in Judges. The Old Testament and the New Testament, they line up. This is awesome, right? Not to come from a place of strength, but to be content in our weakness that God's strength might shine through. This is the message. This is the message. God God stands against human pride. So God chooses and uses those who are humble. God stands against human self-centered pride. This is the reason for brokenness. And as we conclude this series on brokenness in the world, here is the Here is the only statement that I can make. To God alone be all glory as he works all things together, including the brokenness of this world, for his glory and for the good of those who love him. To God alone be the glory. To God alone be the glory. To God alone be the glory. And we receive the comfort of knowing God is working together our brokenness. In fact, God uses people who are coming from a place of weakness. This means that, this means that God, God will use me even though I am weak. That, that is a great word. A great word that we receive straight from the text of, of Scripture. Glory to God alone as he works all things together, including the brokenness of this world for his glory and for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose.